welcome to the EMS On Air podcast. The mission of this podcast is to keep healthcare providers safe, informed, and prepared. Today's December 7, 2020. I'm Jeff Lassers, and I'll be your host. This episode was recorded on September 30. During this episode, we welcome back Dr. Robert Swore, an emergency center physician at Beaumont Hospital, Royal Oak, right here in Oakland County, Michigan. For over the last 30 years, Dr. Swore has been a staple in the EMS community in Michigan, especially when it comes to the latest research involving EMS and cardiac arrest. Dr. Swore has an intensive background when it comes to EMS cardiac arrest outcome data, and that's why he's here. Data provides us with an objective look at what's supposed to happen versus what actually happened. Sometimes looking at the data from an objective perspective can reveal controversy regarding the best treatment options for cardiac arrest patients. Bottom line, what we expect regarding how things work or how well they work isn't always truth. In this two-part discussion, we discuss many of the controversies that find their way into the discussions of EMS providers and give you the hard facts, as they're currently known. In part one, Dr. Swore discussed the data and related controversies regarding airway, breathing, and ventilation and EMS management of cardiac arrest patients. In today's episode, we get into the details and data of compressions, blood flow, and circulation. Like many complicated things, the more I learn about cardiac arrest care, the more I realize how much I don't know. This is a really good episode, and I got a lot out of it, and I hope you do too. Please keep emailing your questions, comments, feedback, and episode ideas to the EMS On Air podcast team by email at qi at ocmca.org. Also, check out our website, emsonair.com, for the latest information, podcast episodes, and other details. Follow us on Instagram. And please, whatever podcast platform you use, subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us grow this project. I really can't say this enough. Please leave us a rating and a review and help us get noticed by a much larger audience on a much larger scale. Remember, the mission of the EMS On Air podcast is to keep healthcare providers safe, informed, and prepared. So increasing our ratings and reviews gets us noticed by more listeners and more sponsors that will lead us to increasing our reach, resources, experts, and abilities. Bottom line, ratings and reviews are vital to the growth of this project, and your contribution will give us what we need to serve those that serve our communities. The only cost to you is a few minutes giving us a rating and a review on whatever podcast platform that you use. We're available on pretty much every platform that you can think of, so it's super quick and easy for you. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the podcast. Good morning, Dr. Swar. How are you today? I'm good, Jeff. Yourself? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for joining me today. So in our last discussion, we ended with cardiac arrest controversies and maybe a little bit of cardiac arrest care clarity. We ended on the rescue trial. And we talked about the use of impedance threshold devices. And these are devices that create a negative pressure inside the chest by putting the device on the end of an endotracheal tube or an LMA or a supraglottic airway device. And it only limits the amount of air that can get inside the chest to create a negative pressure that's going to allow the heart to fill and create more cardiac output. So give us a little background on these ITDs, those who might not have listened to the first episode yet. Describe the use in the science that supports the use of these devices in cardiac arrest. The impedance threshold device, like you said, increases negative interthoracic pressure. So if you think about it as you're ventilating somebody, you're doing bag valve mass ventilation, you squeeze the bag, the air goes in, you put your thumb over the endotracheal tube, and when the air comes out, it has nowhere to go, so it's like a straw, so it causes a negative interthoracic pressure. So that's important. That's how the impedance threshold device works. That increases venous return. It actually, in some studies, suggests that it decreases intracranial pressure through the veins that are in the spine, it results in increased blood flow and increased cardiac output. So there's one big study that did not show clinical benefit. There's some questions about that study, but there's certainly a lot of literature that suggests that this increases blood flow, and there is a fair amount of use in the country. 
Now, these devices aren't just being used for cardiac arrest, and we covered that in uh, the other episode we did with Dr. Swar. So go back and listen to that if you want to catch up on those ITDs. But in a lot of times, these ITDs are used in concert with what are called active compression, decompression CPR devices. These devices are used where you're pushing down like traditional CPR to create the compression, but then you're actively pulling up on the device to expand the size of the chest with a suction cup on the end of it. Dr. Swore, you've had experience with trials in the past. You have a lot of background in this. Can you please describe what ACD CPR is and a brief overview of the science behind it? Yeah, so basically the ACD, Active Compression Decompression CPR device, is a medical grade plunger. So it was designed by Keith Lurie, who's a electrophysiologist in Minnesota, who had a patient come in with their spouse. The spouse took a plunger, did CPR because he couldn't bend over, get on the floor and do CPR, and the patient survived. Dr. Lurie, being the brilliant guy he is, thought about that and thought about the physiology and the physiology of expanding the chest by pulling up on the chest, decompression, increases blood flow, increases subsequent cardiac output, and at least as a theoretical construct, would improve cardiac output during CPR and survival. So over the years, there's been a lot of basic science work, laboratory work, small studies in different places around the country, some larger studies in Germany and Paris. And then there was a study that was done in five centers in the U.S. evaluating whether ACD CPR, the combination of a compression decompression device and the ITD, the impedance threshold device, improved survival compared to just the ITD and just standard CPR. So I have to disclose first that I was an investigator in that trial. It's called the rescue trial. So I'm biased. No question I'm biased. But the results of the study showed a better outcome to discharge and better outcome with neurologic survival with the combination of those two devices compared to standard CPR. For those of you who are interested in maybe Googling the rescue trial, it's R-E-S-Q, rescue trial. And now it's marketed by Zoll as a rescue system, not to get into the business of it. Yeah, a lot of these devices tend to get purchased and bought by other companies. Right now, if you are interested, you can look for Zoll's rescue CPR system, which uses an ITD and an ACD CPR device. We are not sponsored by Zoll currently. There's no advertising. We're just giving you information and where you can find more information on this. Right. And we talked a little bit about the use of the device and the limitations of the device. But as you can imagine, when you're pushing down with CPR and pulling up, which is what the device does, it's a suction cup that attaches to the chest. It adheres to the chest and pulls up on the chest that there's approximately twice as much work to do CPR because you have to pull it, push down, pull that forward. Now, obviously, like any technique, you can learn to get good at it. But at least initially, when we started the study, This was very difficult physically for EMS providers to do, and that was a limitation. I think over time, people got better, but it's still push down, pull up, push down, pull up, and it works. In my biased opinion, it works to improve blood flow. We had good outcomes, but it appeared to cause a lot more work for your standard issue firefighter doing CPR. Uh, Yes, the device does seem anecdotally to work. I've used it on mannequins. I've never used it in the field, but it certainly feels as if my cardiac compression stroke is longer and more effective. Feels good. It's this device. It's got two handles on it. You're holding on to it. Your technique is similar, but you're elevated a little bit at your contact at the chest. And then the rate is a little bit slower. I think they have their metronome set at about 80 do a little bit less. So getting used to the rate is different. And then there's a click for down and a click for up. If you have any musical talent, you probably won't have any problems. If you're like me and you have very little musical talent, getting the beat down was a little tough, Uh, but I, I figured it out within a few minutes. It was a great device, but you point out a great fact. Many EMS agencies are seeing the benefit of taking a person a human off the chest and replacing it with mechanical CPR devices. Now there's a lot of them out there. There is the Zoll Autopulse. There is the Lucas device. Can you please compare and contrast mechanical CPR devices that use ACD CPR and devices that don't? So 
the two devices are the autopulse, as you said, the two more common devices, and the Lucas device. The Lucas device has a suction cup, which looks like the active compression, decompression CPR. The auto pulse is what they call a load bearing band, which are two straps that are Velcro that reach over the chest and squeeze, release, squeeze, release, forming forward flow like CPR. The ACD device, the Lucas device, has the potential to cause decompression as well as compression, and for that reason is an attractive alternative. Most people that end up using it don't make the chest bare. They don't adjust it necessarily so that you get adequate decompression, but it has the potential to cause compression and decompression. And in theory, if we used ITDs with the Lucas device, we could substantially increase blood flow during cardiac arrest. So those are the two devices. So mechanical CPR devices, to compare and contrast versus ACD CPR, some mechanical CPR devices have the capability of producing decompression, some do not. We talked about the Zoll Autopulse, which uses a band that goes across the chest and does this circumferential squeezing around the entire thoracic part of the body. And then Stryker makes the Lucas device, which uses basically a piston with a suction cup on the end. Interestingly enough, Zoll (laughs) has the ITD and Stryker has the piston with a suction cup on the end. Weird. Uh, So those devices that specifically are being used all over the place, is there any literature or studies or data that's demonstrating a benefit of improved cardiac arrest survival outcomes when you use mechanical versus not mechanical? So there's a lot of literature on mechanical CPR devices. And the early studies were conflicting in that there was one study that was done a national study was multi-center study, and it showed a worse outcome with devices compared to standard CPR. So when you get back in there and dig into it, it seemed like that the devices took some time to put on. The providers were so focused on putting the device on that they forgot to do standard CPR or it delayed getting standard CPR. So there were these long pauses that resulted in worsened outcomes. I think by and large, people get it now that whatever device you're using, that you want to do that quickly and you want to minimize pauses. So I haven't seen literature that identifies that the devices are worse than control than standard CPR. But on the other side of this, there aren't studies that show a survival benefit. In other words, that patients do better with mechanical CPR than standard CPR. So that's sort of the concern. And if that's the case, if lives aren't saved with the devices, why use them? So um, I think that's really the begs the question. And when you do mechanical CPR, when you implement mechanical CPR, there's a learning curve of getting the device on right, getting it on quickly. But once you do, you realize that, oh, this circumstance all of a sudden becomes a lot calmer. And you don't have people swapping in and out. You don't have different people at different rates doing CPR. You don't have people falling off the chest, et cetera, et cetera. All those things that all of us have witnessed when you watch CPR. So they sort of transform the resuscitation into a calmer, mechanized, if you will, event. So I was a skeptic. I didn't see the benefit of it. They're expensive. And I had to, I have to tell you that I've come to appreciate the non-survival benefit value of having a device that provides some consistency and reliability in terms of how CPR is done. So that's, I think, the good news. In this, in southeastern Michigan, at least, for the most part, I've seen the Lucas device. So I'm intrigued by that because of the potential to do compression, decompression device, although I haven't seen a lot of people focus on that portion of it. So should everybody do mechanical CPR? Should this be the, is this the best thing since sliced bread? And does this allow us to do all sorts of things that we've never done before? Well, probably not. Certainly it helps things on scene. It helps things in the emergency department. It makes things more efficient in the cath lab. And if you're responding and you've got one ALS unit with two providers and one police officer and maybe a bystander doing CPR, then no question that it makes sense to have mechanical pair of hands to displace that and allow all the other things in resuscitation to happen. Make sense? It makes absolute sense, sir. 
Now, then, one of the things that I've noticed is, is you pointed out the calm and controlled atmosphere that it facilitates. When we go to any place now and we get that Lucas device on, you feel the room go, <sighs> now I can't speak for other agencies about administering the standard of care that they should be doing. I can certainly see being distracted by a new device, but if you're training adequately, you should be able to deploy that without disrupting your other standards of care. Now at my agency, we're very lucky. We have a lot of great people on scene for a cardiac arrest and everybody's working in concert together. It's not always possible. You know, there's places that you might have one care provider for a while. So I think the big thing to look at at your agency is the task, condition, and standards of cardiac arrest. The task is provide the highest quality CPR you can for the people in need. The conditions are, well, how many people do you have? How far are you from the people? How far are you from the hospitals? There's all these things you got to keep in concern. And then you got to compare your standards. What do I have to do per the rules? And what do I have to do per my own policies and regulations? So I'm with you in that it's not for every agency. It's not for every situation, but it certainly seems to be very helpful. And to quote my friend, Matt Dwyer, who's captain of Madison Heights Fire Department, he gave the firefighter of the year at Madison Heights Fire last year was Firefighter Lucas for all the saves he did. So we joke that everybody gets their pulse back with Lucas. They might not survive, but man, do we get pulses back a lot. Anecdotally, that is. Again, and that is anecdotally, and that's the survival benefit is not really borne out by the literature but there's clearly a benefit there. The other reasons that people have wanted to implement mechanical CPR is that it made it safer to do CPR in the back of a moving ambulance while you're going to the hospital. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes, but clearly it's better to have a mechanical device doing CPR in the back of a moving vehicle rather than a firefighter or EMS personnel standing up doing CPR, suboptimal CPR with one hand while they're holding on a bar and hoping that they don't get creased by a vehicle going through lights and sirens while they're on the strain. So there's clearly a safety initiative. There's certainly a, a safety mandate, but and we'll talk about CPR and progress to the hospital in a couple of minutes. Uh, the other issue is, is they're mechanical devices. They're very good at generating consistent pressure and force. And as a result, in a lot of studies, you'll see there's an increased rate of rib fractures. There is a much higher rate of sternal fractures. No surprise there, right? It makes sense that you're pushing down on the chest harder. And those are not necessarily unavoidable complications of CPR, but they certainly are more frequent in mechanical CPR. And I wonder if it's because it's unavoidable or if the devices aren't calibrated appropriately to give appropriate depth of compression. Where that turns into a problem is, is we had at least a couple of people that I've seen that were got resuscitated, went to the ICU, got cooled, woke up, were starting to get better, but their chest was hurting so much and they had a sternal fracture that they stayed in the ICU for another week because you couldn't get them off the ventilator because their chest cavity, you lost integrity of your chest cavity. Now, give me a sternal fracture and a longer ventilation versus cardiac arrest and death, but there are complications nonetheless that we have to be aware of. So is it more of just being aware that it's not a, you know, there are downstream effects to this. It's not just a, it provides this and that's it. There are effects we need to be cognizant of. Now you're pointing out the fact that life in pain is better than the death part of that. You know, you can get a chance at continuing on pain-free eventually. Right. So I think care has to be taken. You have to pay attention to what's going on on scene and the, the device has to be adjusted correctly. And perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps that's unavoidable. But like any technology that we use, like any procedure we do, there's side effects. So that's where I probably as a summary of mechanical CPR devices, I think we're going to see them more and more as the price goes down, as more people use them, and they do change the dynamic of the arrest. But by the same token, there, there are side effects. Optimally, I'd love to see the Lucas decompression, decompression device with an ITD and to me, that has the potential to transform cardiac arrest. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, I agree. I'm very excited to now have mechanical CPR where I work. And I would love to see the Lucas device utilize the decompression to see if there's even more of an effect in the field. <clears throat> I use them. Sure. So 
that kind of covers the big deal there of the mechanical CPR devices. Now, after I get that device on, it's obviously, we mentioned that it's a lot calmer and it allows me to focus on a lot of other things. One of them is my thought process on which drug selection, uh, vascular access, things of that nature. And it begs the question, when we're talking about vascular access and drugs, IOs versus IVs, can you compare and contrast the benefits of IOs versus IVs in cardiac arrest patients? Certainly early on, we used IOs for kids as early resuscitation kids are tough to get vascular access. Then the technology changed where you had different variety of IO devices, you know, just a spring-loaded gun, a drill, various permutations of that, and they allowed for us to do intraosseous drug and fluid administration in adults as well as children. So the IO devices are the slickest thing since sliced bread. They're quick, they're easy, they're fast. They're generally easier to do than an IV in a patient with end-stage renal disease or 250 pounds, 400 pounds, whatever. Somebody's been in the hospital a lot that's had difficulty with vascular access. So it allows us a clear option to provide vascular access. They're also nice because they can be provided in the lower extremity where you're away from all the hubbub of doing CPR, managing the airway, et cetera, et cetera. In the old, early days of CPR, you know, medics took great pride in endotracheal intubating, putting an external jugular in, giving drug through the external jugular, which was a big honk and vein that you could see fairly readily. And that's kind of gone by the wayside, I think. So IOs are easy to do. Medics are very comfortable with doing them. They work pretty quickly and they're faster than getting an IV in a number of cases. So that's the theory. The reality is we don't know necessarily if they're better than peripheral IVs. So when you're doing CPR, you're pushing blood flow forward from the chest. When you pull up on the chest, blood flow is going back from the lower extremities, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. But there's some theory that if you're doing a lower extremity IV or IO and you push a drug, it just takes longer to get to the heart and gets back to the arterial side of the circulation where the drugs actually work. You know, epinephrine in particular works by causing peripheral vascular constriction. It isn't its direct effect on the heart. So epinephrine, when you give it, has to go up through the lower extremity if you're using an IO, back to the inferior vena cava, up into the heart, back out to the arterial circulation, and causes peripheral vascular constriction is where its benefit is during cardiac arrest. So there's a few studies that have compared IOs to IVs. Nobody's done a good, large, randomized controlled trial comparing those two, the same drugs with the two different devices. There are a couple of large studies that compare IO use of drug to IV use of drug. And one, the ALPS trial was a multi-center study using amniodarone and lidocaine for cardiac arrest for VFib. What they identified is that amnio and lidocaine are slightly better than placebo for shock refractory VFib, but they looked at their data in a secondary fashion and found out that if you gave the drugs IO, there was no difference compared to placebo. But if you gave the drugs IV, there was a difference in their effect compared to placebo. So the suggestion is that, huh, maybe the IO drugs aren't getting there in a timely enough fashion to have an effect. Did they compare the location of the IO? My reason I'm asking is because Dr. Schutte over at Southfield Providence, I'm sorry, Ascension Providence, Southfield, whatever it's called now, hospital, she says when you're doing an IO for a cardiac arrest patient, the only reason she would like you to do it in the leg versus the arm is because the patient doesn't have an arm. That should be the only reason you don't do a humeral IO because what I'm being told by groups that manufacture these IOs, if you go in the humeral head, it appears it can get the medication to the heart in three seconds in some of these devices. So is that humorous? Is that the standard line we're supposed to use there? Well, that seems to be where I'm hearing more and more people say the humeral head is becoming more of the primary selection of your IO administration because of its rapid administration of medications and fluids to the heart. Now, that's what I'm being told. 
I have not spent my time diving into the details of this, but anecdotally, that's what I'm being told. I know of a new device called the NEO, NIO. They were making the big gun before, and, and I think they still are, but I think they're also now making the NEO, and they have some really cool videos out there. Again, they're not an advertiser or sponsor, but they are advertising that it can get to the heart in less than three seconds. Yeah. So first, the literature on existing studies is what's been done in the field, which historically has been almost entirely tibial IO. So the studies that looking at that, I think there's another study that's, again, a secondary analysis, a big study that was looking at epinephrine use, the paramedic two trial. And I don't think they showed a benefit of IO versus IV or a difference between IO or IV, but I haven't seen that particular study yet. Humeral IOs versus tibial IOs. So as we discussed the physiology of lower extremity IVs, there was actually a project done where somebody injected drug, a nuclear medicine drug through the lower extremity and did CPR, and then they scanned. And then you saw this bolus of drug go forward towards the feet during compression, and then backward up towards the heart when you let up, and then push down again, it goes forward. So there was some early literature that suggested that lower extremity drugs don't get to the heart at all. And then the sponsors of the IO, the humeral IOs, inject IV tracers, uh, cardio green, and then take pictures and show that the blood flow from the upper extremity IO device goes relatively quickly. So the question is, should we be doing humeral IOs? So as you know, Tibia is a lot easier to find than a humeral head, so it's easier to do the tibia. We need practice with doing the humeral IOs, and there's promise there that suggests that they're, the humeral IOs give superior blood flow, get to the arterial circulation faster. Humeral IO, of course, is difficult in February in Michigan and to go through a coat. It's more difficult because you've got somebody doing CPR or you've got your CPR device and you've got somebody else bagging. So it's logistically difficult and it's a little harder to stabilize while you're moving the patient. So there's some practical obstacles, but the suggestion that's made by the, your colleague from Ascension Providence is correct, is that there's literature that suggests that a proximal humeral IO provides superior blood flow and faster delivery of drug to the target site than a regular IO. So that's interesting. I think I want to get a little bit to not only just vascular access, but the drugs themselves. There's been a lot of changes if we can talk about that. So um, epinephrine is, of course, the drug we've used forever, and it works well with cardiac arrest. When you read the guidelines, they all say it's indeterminate in terms of its value. The reason for that is, is nobody's proved that it improves survival. There's a big study out of England, again, 8,000 cardiac arrest victims called the Paramedic 2 trial, and they compared epinephrine to placebo. So resuscitation with epinephrine versus no epinephrine in CPR. So you can imagine that makes for very dull resuscitation when you've got nothing to do except keep doing CPR and hope that the patient comes back and give other drugs for antiarrhythmics, et cetera. But what they showed is, is that patients got resuscitated at a much higher rate with epinephrine. The reason, of course, is epinephrine causes peripheral vasoconstriction, constriction, increases coronary perfusion pressure, increases blood flow to the heart. But it didn't increase survival to discharge. And in fact, there was some literature that suggested, there were studies suggested that the increase in survival, the mild increase in survival, resulted in patients with bad outcomes. So the only survivors were patients with bad outcomes, as opposed to leave the hospital alive neurologically intact. So that's disturbing because it challenges what we've all done for a long period of time in cardiac arrest. This is that epinephrine is the mainstay of giving drugs in cardiac arrest. So it does increase resuscitation. It gets patients' hearts started but it perhaps doesn't improve the neurologic environment. It causes peripheral vasoconstriction, causes vasoconstriction in the brain, decreases cerebral blood flow, and decreases survival, you know, blood flow and then neurologic outcome. That's been parsed a number of different ways. The time to give drug was from 20 minutes after the 911 call was the average time to giving drug. That suggests that, well, maybe the drug's given too late. 
And that's why patients don't survive. So if you get there fast, you get there within four minutes, you have a first responder drill a tibia, for example, or start an IV and give drug early, would that improve survival? We still don't know the answer to that, but there still isn't data that shows that early epinephrine improves survival compared to late epinephrine versus placebo. So very interesting is that the more we know about this, the less we really know about cardiac arrest survival. Epinephrine is still the standard of care. It improves resuscitation. The science underpinning it is weak. EMS providers that are listening to this may be a little bit confused or feel maybe a little bit conflicted now because they're going to look at their protocols. They're going to go to ACLS class and it's, what is this? It's, it's epinephrine the treatment. <clears throat> Not this situation, epinephrine's the treatment. So give them some solace into you're still helping because I don't want anybody to walk away discouraged saying, well, if there's no evidence, I just interpret that a little bit to assure that we're still giving this to the standard of care that is set forth. Yeah. And that's exactly the right question is, is that, well, do we stand there and do CPR and defibrillate and if that doesn't work, just pronounce patients? We don't know that for a fact. But as you know, this is science and there's science behind this and it's complex. So I think the standard now is early epinephrine. If you could do a humeral IO, I think that's probably better. My personal opinion is, is a early upper extremity IV is better than a tibial IO. A tibial IO is better than spending 10 minutes on scene trying to get an upper extremity IV. And I think we're going to learn more about this going forward. So those would be the recommendations. Just to make things even more confusing for you, let me do that. Is, is that there's some literature that if you use devices like the compression decompression device, the blood flow is so much better that you don't have to give epinephrine and you don't have the vasoconstriction in the brain. And maybe the devices can improve blood flow to the degree that a patient could be resuscitated. That's all stuff that's out there. That's not ready for prime time. That's not ready for use in the street, but it's a question. Well, it's certainly ready for discussion and thought and inspiration, because even though this may cause a little bit of confusion, we talk about what quote unquote works and doesn't work and based on the statistics of something, it is cool to know that we're learning more. The more we learn, the more I realize I don't know, and the more it expands our ability to consume information. And I think it's pretty cool. We are seeing an increased ability throughout my career of, I don't know, 18 years, whatever I'm doing now, of the amount of equipment available to me and its effectiveness in CPR. I don't have the numbers, but anecdotally, it feels like we can do a whole lot more on scene with a whole lot greater effect and more resources. But how has that changed the world of terminating efforts in the field? Because at the end of the day, sometimes patients expire. We always talk about the fact that there's an increased safety factor if you're going to be transporting a cardiac arrest patient with mechanical CPR in place because it keeps all the EMS providers butts in seats with a seatbelt on, which makes them safer. Other than that, can you give us an update and put this all together into the world of field termination in EMS and cardiac arrest care? There was actually some early literature from the early 90s that Art Kellerman, who's a really bright guy, and uh, I think he's the dean of the School of Uniform Health Services now, did some CPR research. And his conclusion of his paper was work them to death in the field, which was a good aphorism, you know. The concept being that if you're going down steps, if you're going out into the ambulance, if you're driving in route to the hospital, then the resuscitation effort of doing mechanical, doing CPR, getting drug, it's doing rhythm interpretation is suboptimal. So his concept was do everything you can in the field to resuscitate a patient. That's really, with rare exception, the same stuff that we're going to do in the emergency department. And we'll talk about the limitations of that. If the patient doesn't respond to resuscitative efforts in the field, then maybe they should not maybe they should be pronounced. That's been in place for different places across the country for decades. I think Seattle King County doesn't transport anybody that doesn't get resuscitated. They just routinely pronounce all patients at home or wherever the arrest is, unless there's a family issue or some other exigency that where it's not safe to pronounce the patient and leave. 
there's a lot of early studies in terms of TOR, they call it, termination or resuscitation criteria. Basically, it's unwitnessed, asystolic, people that you would think that wouldn't survive, that don't respond, that don't get defibrillated at any point in the resuscitation, and don't respond to resuscitative efforts. So there's old literature on that. I think most CPR researchers are of the opinion that you should work them to death on scene and that there's select subset of patients, refractory V-fibs, that should be routinely transported. But other patients, particularly unwitnessed, particularly patients that use systolic, that don't respond to resuscitation, that we should be pronouncing on scene. That's mostly because of medical futility, but it's also for provider safety, it also provides for better resuscitation. The discussion is, is that if you're responding and you're providing care on scene, rather than focusing on, well, we got to pack this guy up and get going, we focus on this is the drug we need, this is the rhythm, this is the cardiac compressions we get, et cetera, et cetera. That's the idea behind termination or resuscitation on scene. There's some interesting stuff that documents that EMS agencies that pronounce that transport more patients with CPR in progress have worse survival rates than people that work patients to death on scene. So there is a, actually there was a study in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, that's a big study that was published a few weeks ago that actually documented that there's worse survival for EMS agencies that transport patients with CPR in progress. And the theory, of course, is, is that they're not being aggressive with the resuscitation on scene. The theory being that the goal was to get off scene and they weren't. Can you expand on that? The sure. Theory. So there were shorter times on scene, less complete resuscitation on scene. The focus was, well, he's not responded to two epinephrines and a defibrillation shock and an advanced airway. Let's run as opposed to going through the entire algorithm. If you remember the CPR lectures in ACLS, where coronary blood flow goes up gradually during CPR, you get off the chest, pause in the chest, the blood flow dumps. The more you interrupt to get out of the living room, go down the steps, load the vehicle, transport, there's more interruptions in all those places. And all those interruptions result in loss of coronary blood flow, loss of ability to resuscitate the patient. Is it possible that, well, not only when you're trying to scoop and swoop off scene, obviously you're focused on getting off scene and not the, like you said, the steps of the algorithm, which are built to to build that blood pressure, to put them in greatest chance of survival, but also the time it takes to move them from the floor to the cot to the ambulance, all those steps. There's And there's no way you're providing compression the entire time unless you have a mechanical device on board. So what about in those situations? Is it still the fact that they're trying to get off scene that may be creating these drop-off points of compressions? Well, and I don't think anybody's looked at that issue, but there's still the issue of is the patient getting drugged frequently are you doing rhythm checks frequently? If you're going down the steps, the patient's in V-fib the whole time, you're moving the patient, can you defibrillate in a timely fashion? Once you start moving, do you continue moving all the way through the continuum of care until you drop them off in the ER? Or do you really stop along the way to do the resuscitation that needs to get done? So I think it's complex and I think it's somewhat operational research as opposed to medical care. And nobody's looked at specifically if we transport with mechanical CPR in progress, does that prevent things happen? I can only tell you that mechanical CPR hasn't increased the rates of survival, and you would think that that would have some impact on field termination. So I think the consensus of the literature is that patients should be worked to death on scene as much as possible. You know, based on all the information that I'm aware of as a paramedic in the field, I don't think anything specifically for me and my actions have changed with these introductions of new devices. It's just using them in that environment. Nothing has changed in our transport program. <clears throat> Nothing has changed in, in really our care. It's just the devices we have to administer that care. And I look forward to continuation of using these under our current protocols so that we can get the data to tell us what is that next step of the evolution. Yeah. And I think where we are now is, is devices are a related but 
maybe separate question of field termination is, is that the consensus of the scientific community is, is that work them to death on scene. Now, what's interesting and related to that is, is that about 40% of patients that get resuscitated on scene re-arrest. So there's now starting to be a focus on should we be doing a bundle of things, getting a 12-lead EKG, giving them a fluid bolus to get people's pressure over, make sure the airway is stabilized, recheck blood pressure, control arrhythmias, all that stuff before the patient's transported. And there's some interesting stuff that's coming out now that suggests that this bundle of care after resuscitation, before we move, is better than, oh God, he's got a pulse, let's snatch him and run to the hospital. So again, this period of post-ROSC stabilization may be important. And you're going to see more on that going forward. Yeah, it, it's expressed, I know, in our local protocols, and I know this isn't nuanced to Oakland County. I, I'm pretty sure King County out in uh, the west side of the country and many agencies throughout the United States do this, but a lot aren't transporting a ROSC patient until they have five minutes of sustained ROSC. And within that time, you should be administering a bolus, you should be maintaining the monitor, you should be getting a 12 lead. And there's a few other things you can do that, like you're saying, I like the term bundling the care at the end. It's still a part of the preparation for transport, but we're taking a minute to confirm we have ROSC. There's a number of things that got to be done in a changing condition, like a 12 lead set of vital signs and a bolus. Then right. we feel good. Then we can go. And I think you're right. It feels like the next logical progression in the team approach to cardiac arrest care. Yeah, if you can prevent re-arrest because the patient's blood pressure is 110 versus 80, if you can prevent refibrillation because the patient's still having PVCs after a primary V-fib arrest and gets lidocaine or amniodarone, I think more people are starting to go back to lidocaine a bit, which is interesting. But that bundle of care to stabilize the patient after resuscitation may in fact be our next new kill to climb. Yeah, I'm seeing more, anecdotally, I'm seeing more ROSC on scene, which means that, oh, geez, okay, now what? Because I'm not used to seeing so much ROSC. And this is now that opportunity, man, preventing the rearrest is like its own thing, right? Like loading the heart up now, making sure we got that bolus, protecting that blood pressure, what medications. And then on top of that, there's all these new devices and communication tools to call your local medical control, online medical direction, tell them what's going on and be like, hey, this is what I got. Before I go, hey, you know, you might want to give them who knows a don X milligrams or whatever. So building on the cardiac arrest care and expanding it now that we these incremental changes, this is super cool. If I do have a cardiac arrest patient, a lot of times there are these studies going on with this acronym that I'm not so familiar with called ECMO. Can you tell us about ECMO and how it applies to these patients for cardiac arrest? Yeah. And before I leave that, we kind of gone full circle because stabilizing the patient after ROSC is really within the scope of practice of a paramedic. Medical control is an important component of this. But I think part of what the medical community looks is to the medics for is they know how to do this stuff. And if people are going to get, survive, it's going to be because EMS saves them. Sometimes I get the sense of the medic says, well, we got RASP, we got to get them to the hospital and get them out of our hands. And in reality, what we're looking for is the medic to function to the level of their ability, which they can do to stabilize, control blood pressure, control dysrhythmias, interpret 12 lead EKGs and all that stuff to save care. So this is, again, where we started is, is that EMS safe life, cardiac arrest, and this is all part of that piece. Let me just talk very briefly that we're talking about field termination and work them to death on scene. Some places are turning that concept on its head a little bit, and they're taking patients in refractory V-fib, shock them a couple times, start a line, give some epinephrine, put them on a Lucas, and snatching them with CPR in progress with a mechanical device and taking them to a specialized cardiac arrest resuscitation center. This is being done in a few places in Europe. The place that's had the most experience in the U.S. is in Minneapolis, where Demetrius Yiannopoulos, which who's a crazy Greek who 
lives for cardiac arrest recess resuscitation. And what he does and what his group has done is, is that he'll take a radio call from a medic somewhere in the city that says we've got a patient with refractory VF with CPRs in progress, put them on the Lucas. They take the patient directly from the field to the cardiac cath lab, bypassing the emergency department where Dr. Yiannopoulos is ready for the patient. They'll take a couple of garden hoses, actually there are 16 French catheters that they'll stick into the femoral artery and femoral vein. So they're huge catheters. Do that with the Lucas in place, CPR in progress, and then run the arterial catheter through a ECMO pump. ECMO, extra membrane corporeal oxygenation. So basically what it is, is it's peripheral bypass. So it oxygenates the blood, runs it back into the femoral vein to control blood flow. Uh, they basically put the patient on bypass. Once he's got the patient blood flow going, does a cardiac catheterization, opens the presumed artery for the patient refractory V-fib, which has caused the refractory V-fib, leaves them on ECMO for a couple of days, depending on how the patient responds. So for those patients, in at least the Minneapolis experience, is they've set it up. You just can't do this at the local hospital. And he's set up a system that he's got technicians, the lab, et cetera, et cetera, to respond. And what they've done is those patients are probably twice as likely to survive as patients without that kind of therapy. It's not for everybody. It's patients that are older than 18, younger than 70. They're refractory V-fibs, so they're, wit they're more likely witnessed. They're not your standard CPR. And they're patients without renal failure, dementia, cancer, et cetera. They're high, potentially high-yield people. And it's very interesting that they've done probably a couple hundred patients now, and they've had more than a 40% survival as opposed to 15%, which would be the control group. Patients that were similar historically that didn't get the benefit of that therapy. So it's pretty cool. Is it going to happen in every place in the country? Could we do it in Oakland County? I guess that's possible, but systems have to be in place to do it, and we're never going to do it as a one-off. So give me a little bit like a scenario, like I get this guy, I'm like, hey, let's say we have ECMO in here, and we, hey, we got to get this guy over to SOAR. We got to get him over there. What does that patient look like to the average EMS provider refractory? Give me a little bit more detail on that. So I think everybody's experience is most of the cardiac arrest. You shock them, you work them, you give them drugs. They're not getting a pulse back. You look at the rhythm. It is sinus, then it looks like idioventricular rhythm, then it looks like asystolic and it's been 30, 40 minutes, and it's time to stop. Everybody also has that experience where, damn, we shock this guy, he gets a pulse back. He's got a rhythm. He goes back and be fib. We shock him. He goes back and be fib. You get a pulse back. You start moving him. You're comfortable. He goes back and be fib. So everybody, I think, has had that experience of these codes that last forever, and they're punctuated by intermittent return of pulse, intermittent perfusing rhythm, or they stay in this course V-fib and they look and say, it's a 45-year-old guy, I can't quit on him. So they're very frustrating clinically. And the theory is, is that there's an irritable focus. There's a reason that this person keeps going into V-fib. And we think the reason is, and the reason to do this is, is they've got a STEMI, they've got a thrombus in their coronary artery. They've got ischemic myocardium that's irritable and keeps going in and out of V-fib. If you can stabilize that person, if you can take that clot out, if you can do that PCI, if you can dilate that coronary artery, then in theory, that patient may stabilize. The challenge, of course, is, is they've been down for a bit. They're acidotic. They've had no blood flow to their heart or their brain for a while. They need a period of time to be resuscitated. So this is potentially a way to work. There's few patients that meet that criteria. And for those places that have set up a system to do that, you need enough cases to make it worthwhile to have cath lab on call, the ECMO devices, 
U of M started a project where they were looking to see if the emergency physicians could put the patients on ECMO while the cardiologist comes in, so do it in parallel. So there's some places that are trying to do that, and we don't know how many of those patients can be saved and if it's worthwhile to develop this whole big system. But you can imagine the concept of driving from Holly to Beaumont, for instance, with a 50-year-old refractory V-fib as opposed to just pronouncing that patient and could that work. There's a concept there. It works in some places. It's not ready for prime time yet. It's very much a research application. It sounds like it's worthy of continuation of research, and it sounds really exciting, and I hope it's very successful because in areas like Southeast Michigan, we are so dense, rich with talent, resources, and and great stuff. It's just a matter of what is all the data, exactly how does it work, and then how do you make all these pieces work in concert? Right now, like you said, we're at the research phase. We need to know so much more in order to put it in place, no matter what you have available to you. You still need to know all of the data first so that you can make the best decision moving forward. And it's interesting. I was looking at some old slides and I found my old ACLS slides where there's this picture of a watch. And I think a lot of you have seen those. And it says brain death starts to happen at four minutes and brain death is certain at 10 minutes. And that was the early knowledge of CPR. There are people that get resuscitated that have had 65, 90 minutes, that get intermittent resuscitation, et cetera, that go home and leave the hospital alive. I went to a lecture at the Heart Association meeting last week, last year, I haven't gone anywhere last week. And there was a paper where a group that was published in Nature, which is basic science, that they went to a, a stockyard and they took the brains of pigs that had been slaughtered. And four hours later, They took them to the lab and they did physiology tests to see if the mitochondria could make energy and still function. And guess what? The brains were still functional. So we we really don't know how long this brain can last if we can get the heart restarted. So that's EMS's job is get the heart restarted. And the back end of this is way more interesting and way more uncertain than we've ever known. So Work them to death in the scene. Patients that survive virtually always get resuscitated in the field and stabilized. And that's the, I don't know, the essential role of EMS in all this. It's very interesting. Yeah, it feels pivotal to the point where at the end of the day, no matter what science is doing, you still have to have the best compressions and care and standard of care on scene. Bottom line, you got to do that so that the house of medicine can continue to expand our capabilities when we do get that ROSC. And in respect to that, these situations present data. You're really throwing it at me right now is where do we need to focus our efforts? Number one, work them to death in the field. That seems to be no matter what. But beyond that, where would you suggest that the healthcare community and the house of medicine, EMS needs to start focusing or needs to continue focusing their efforts in order to improve cardiac arrest survival? This is really at the level, this is for EMS providers generally. So I think good basic fundamentals of CPR, knowledgeable airway management, thoughtful airway management, good ventilation, not overventilation, vascular access and early drug management, stabilization on scene, all of those things will have a synergistic effect to improve resuscitation rates. Where the EMS EMS emergency medical service systems, where the systems need to go, is I think one of the things we need to look at is getting patients taken to hospitals that are really interested in taking care of these patients. I think that there's a lot of difference in the interest of hospitals and whether they're aggressive in caring for post-arrest patients or more nihilistic of, gee, he's 80, he's had a good life, bring the family and let him go. So I think the hospital side of this has work to do and we're looking at those issues. I don't think those are EMS provider issues. I think we take patients to hospitals that have a cath lab because STEMI patients should go to the lab regardless of whether they wake up or not. But there's more to be done on the distal part of the system, if you will, the part farthest away from the community. I think we'll get there. I think that there's still continued interest in cardiac arrest. As I get older, I have more of a vested interest in making sure all this stuff's in place so that 
when I have my cardiac arrest, I get the best care possible from the time somebody picks up 911 until the time I leave the hospital. So all that stuff needs to happen. That's awesome. I totally agree. And I can promise you that I don't speak for every provider listening, but I speak for myself. I'll do a about 99% good. Just kidding. I'm going to do what I can with this information and uh, Thank you very much. make it happen. Thank you very much for your time today, sir. That's all for the show today, everyone. Thank you for listening. We are going to have Dr. Robert Swart back here. Don't you worry. Please keep emailing your questions, comments, feedback, and episode ideas to the EMS On Air podcast team by email at qi at ocmca.org. Also, check out our website, emsonair.com, for the latest information, podcast episodes, and other details. Follow us on Instagram at emsonair. And please, whatever podcast platform you use, subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really, really, really helps us. Thank you for listening to the EMS On Air podcast. Stay safe and have a great day.